Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, from verse 26. But in the six months, the angel Gabriel was sent of God to a city of Galilee, of which the name was Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail thou favored one, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. But she, seeing the angel, was troubled at his word, and reasoned in her mind what this salutation might be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in a womb, and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for the ages, and of his kingdom there shall not be an end. But Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, since I know not a man? And the angel answering said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and power of the highest overshadow thee. Wherefore the holy thing also which shall be born shall be called Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, thy kinswoman, she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the six months to her that was called barren. For nothing shall be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond made of the Lord, be it to me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So far the reading of the scriptures. Perhaps you remember that I said Luke 1 and 2 together present to us ten pictures, ten paintings. And these paintings have been put together in moral order. Sometimes there are also great contrasts. Sometimes there are parallels. We have in verse 26 a remarkable point. It's the date that is mentioned, the six months. That means the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. As we have seen the last time, she hid herself for five months, and so after five months she went back where she lived, and then in the six months the angel Gabriel was sent of God to the city of Galilee. Now it's always good um, for us to keep before us the main theme or themes that is gospel. And one of these prominent themes will be sonship. One of these themes is the grace of God. But let's just go from verse 26, and there we see already an indication of the grace of God. Why do I say this? The angel is sent to the city of Galilee. Galilee was um, called Galilee of the Gentiles. I think it's in Isaiah 9. And Galilee was uh, despised by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. They did not expect much good to come from Galilee. The religious leaders, they looked down on Galilee. But there is where God, in his grace, is working. And we see that even at the end of Matthew's Gospel, God sends the, the Lord sent the disciples after his resurrection to Galilee. That is where God worked in grace. Um, a point to uh, remind us of is that Galilee had a city of refuge, Kadesh, was in Naphtali, in Galilee. And so it was not really a place to be ignored. Nor was Samaria, because Samaria also had a city of refuge, as Judah, Judea had also, besides the three cities, of course, in the other, on the other side of the Jordan River. What we see, in, for example, in John's Gospel, that's especially to demonstrate how the religious leaders despise the grace of God. And that rubbed up uh, the normal, or the normal people, the people, the common people, rather, as we find, for example, in John 1, when Nathaniel heard about the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, when Philip talked to him, Nathaniel said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? So, Nazareth was a place that was not much respected. So, first of all, Galilee, because it's called Galilee of the nations, it was at the border of Israel, it was far from Jerusalem, was not much respected by the Jewish leaders, and we can understand that in a sense, because the Jewish from the Babylonian captivity, the two <coughs> tribes, only a remnant from the two tribes had come back to Jerusalem, 
And so Galilee was really much under the influence of the Gentiles and also Samaria, a mixture with uh, Gentile uh, nations. So we can understand that from uh, this viewpoint of the religious leaders, but they despised the grace of God. And that is also here seen in the fact that Nathaniel says, can, come, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And later when uh, Nicodemus, who was from Jerusalem, but when Nicodemus in chapter 7 uh, said the words to defend the Lord Jesus, um, they said in uh, John 7 verse 47, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But his people, this people who knoweth not the law, are cursed. Nicodemus says unto him, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, does our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he does. Verse 52, They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? So they mock at him. They knew very well that he was from Jerusalem. Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. They didn't know the scriptures because uh, Jonah was from Galilee. We know that very well from the Old Testament. And he had prophesied, find it in Kings. So, but I, I, know, I, know, I point this out to show how the religious leaders despised Galilee and despised Nazareth. Even Nathaniel had no esteem for this uh, place called Nazareth. Whereas, if you look at the meaning of the name Nazareth, we are back now in Luke 1 verse 26, the name uh, means a branch. And in, if you read Matthew 2, there is even a reference to uh, the prophecy on the on connection with the branch or the sprout. So we find in Matthew that there is a link with the prophetic idea that the branch would come, the sprout, that he would reign. But they ignored this completely. They had no idea that God was going to act in grace and bring in the sprout or the branch. The other meaning of the name Nazareth means preserved. So God had preserved a little remnant there in Galilee. Like Joseph and Mary belonged to that little remnant. And God had preserved them. And I draw your attention to that because we notice in Luke 1 and 2, seven different um, representations of this remnant. We saw the last time already, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were from uh, the tribe of Levi. They were living in the whole country of Judea. But here we find... Um, representatives of the remnant in Galilee. God had preserved them. And God, uh, some translate Nazareth as guarded one. Well, anyway, I want to apply this now to those God had guarded there in his wonderful grace. And to that place, Gabriel is sent. What can we learn from this? God in his grace wants to preserve a remnant also today. And God wants to communicate his thoughts to such a remnant. In humility, as Mary and Joseph are found here in humility, but God could communicate in his grace to them. Then we come to verse 27, and there we read that the angel came to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Well, here we need to take a little bit more time, because the virgin birth is a very essential point. And we see in the history of the church that this has been abused or misunderstood in two different ways. On the one hand, people have made too much of it. They have said, Mary is the eternal virgin. Mary was always a virgin and stayed always a virgin. That's a misunderstanding. Or that she was without sin already from her birth. She's called the Immaculate Virgin. That is also a, a misunderstanding. The other extreme is to deny this whole story, to call this a myth. There are people who say, you know, this whole story is really a myth. It is uh, Luke who describes that, but it is a religious myth. And people uh, believe that, not because of the historic facts, but because this had a religious significance. And that's why they believe it. Now, that's also nonsense, of course. And that's even, perhaps in a sense, even worse. Because that puts everything upside down. And that, makes, that would make the scriptures unreliable. Whereas we have seen in Luke 1, in the introduction already, how careful Luke has examined everything and how he presents everything from a historic viewpoint. Now, of course, we don't deny 
that these uh, stories have also a deep moral meaning. So when people speak about the myth of the conception of the virgin birth and, or the virgin conception and birth, they emphasize then, of course, the moral meaning. But you cannot have the moral meaning without the historic facts. I hope you follow what I'm saying. The historic facts are so important that you cannot have the true impact and meaning, the moral meaning of it, without the historic fact. That is the same with the resurrection, when you go to 1 Corinthians 15, there were people who said, you know, yeah, we believe in the resurrection, but Christ has risen in his disciples. You see Christ in the disciples, that is his resurrection. Sounds good, but it is not good at all. Because that denies the historic fact of the resurrection. And the scriptures point out to us the historic facts that are undeniable, that can be searched out, and you can rely on. And why do I emphasize this so much? Because that is then also the guarantee of the prophetic fulfillment. If the historic facts are not really true, and you cannot rely on those facts, then you have no grounds to believe that God will fulfill the prophecy. Because, for example, the verse we have read tonight, in verse 35, the Son of God, okay, no, that's earlier, in verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of God, uh, the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. There we have these two perspectives. The coming of the Lord, his birth, and then right away linked with the millennium, with the reign. Well, if the first fact has doubts or can be interpreted in a different way, what guarantee do you have for the second line, the prophetic line, to be fulfilled? So these uh, points are very important to consider. We see then that she was a virgin. So I have mentioned the two extremes, they are both wrong. What do we have to understand? Yes, she was a virgin. It was not so, like the Pharisees said later, cast doubt on the integrity of this story. And in John 8, for example, when the Lord is discussing with the Pharisees, they uh, say, you do the deeds, or the Lord said, you do the deeds of your father, and then said they to him, we be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. So if there is a reference to his birth, because if you don't believe in the virgin birth, then there is only one alternative, and that was that Mary was guilty of fornication. And that is how the Pharisees looked at it. Now go back to Luke 1, verse 27. She was a virgin, and we know from Matthew 1, she stayed a virgin till after the birth of the Lord Jesus. And there are a few on those points a bit later when we follow those verses. Now the point I want to underline is she was a spouse or betrothed. That means there was a contract. Maybe she was 16, 17 years old, we don't know exactly. A Jewish girl would be a spouse or betrothed early. And that would usually would be a contract of a year. And then after a year, the wedding would take place. But if during that year, she would have sexual relationship with her husband-to-be, then both would be guilty of fornication. Or, if someone would take her, as the Pharisees then suggested in John 8, then she would also be guilty. According to the law in Deuteronomy, we see that when a virgin was seduced in the field outside, then the man who did this was guilty and had to pay uh, the, for, to her father the price of the bride, the dowry to the father, when it would have taken place in a city, then they both needed to be stoned because she could have called for help and she didn't. So the law was very uh, severe on this. You can read it in Deuteronomy. And so that was in order to preserve her as a virgin and also to preserve the husband to be as a virgin. Now, this is also important for us practically, for our young people today, that we follow those uh, lessons that you find here. Uh, illustrated in Joseph's and Mary's faithfulness. We can learn practical lessons also in this sense. We are living in a corrupt society, but these principles are God's principles and they are valid for today as well. But also, a spiritual lesson for us, the believers today, we all together are seen as a virgin. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that he has espoused the believers as a chaste virgin, and wants to present them as in the chastity to Christ as the bridegroom. So Paul's exercise was that the believers would be kept pure 
would be would keep the virgin character till he would present them to the Lord Jesus. That means till the coming of the Lord. Well, that is a great challenge for us today. Do we keep this virgin character? I mean, I'm now making an application, you understand. This is a practical application for us today, that God wants, the Lord wants us to be preserved in virgin character to be for our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. That is a lesson we can draw from this, and that's elaborated in the New Testament. And that's why you see the great Babylon as a harlot. She didn't want to wait, and she picked it as a harlot. Whereas the true believers who want to wait for Christ are subject to persecution and, dis- and uh, reproach, want to keep the virgin character, they will be rewarded the day of the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. In the meantime, it shows very clearly that we can now prepare ourselves to be presented to the Lord as a chaste virgin. That is a great challenge for us, for our daily lives. The other point that we find here Uh, is the name of Mary that I wanted to comment on. Uh, Her name uh, cannot be retraced, the meaning of the name cannot be uh, retraced uh, with absolute certainty. Some uh, link it with the name Mara, Mara means bitterness, uh, and that would uh, remind us then of the rebellion of Israel in the wilderness, in the book of Exodus. Um, That may be in itself a right thought, because Mary, after all, is a representative of the human race, and the human race is seen in rebellion against God. And the grace of God wants to use now a vessel that in itself was or had been in rebellion. That's the lesson we can draw from this, that God wants to use those who have been guilty of rebellion. And think of Miriam, who stood up against uh, Moses. There you find that idea of uh, rebellion. The other meaning is uh, exalted, and that is also a nice meaning, of course that God would take a lowly country girl and exalt her. You have to keep in mind that the Jewish uh, women in those days, they all wanted to get married and have a baby, and they all desired, of course, that he would be the coming Messiah. But only one could have that privilege, and that is Mary, who is going to have that tremendous privilege to be the mother of the Messiah. And in verse 28, the angel comes in to the home and says, Hail. That was a common greeting. We find it in Matthew also that the soldiers who uh, greeted the Lord Jesus said, Hail. Or um, Judah, who, uh, Judah to greet the Lord Jesus said, Hail. The Lord, after his resurrection, when he met the disciples, said, uh, Hail, in plural. And so that was a common greeting. And then what he says there is very particular. Why do I say a common greeting? Because some have made much out of this and put Mary on a high pedestal. That is not what the angel does. Of course, it was a tremendous privilege that she was singled out, chosen by God, for this special task. But the angel does not put her on a pedestal. For example, the next expression, thou that art highly favored of the Lord. Literally it says, having been favored. One who has been favored. That is what it means. And so, there are some translations that say, full of favor, or full of grace. That is not the right translation. That is a corruption of the text. She was the object of favor. And I want you to see that point, because that is one of the great themes of Luke, that God shows his favor to those who don't deserve it. The, the nation of Israel was guilty. God had dispersed them. Even the two tribes had been guilty. And even those 400 thousand years we talked about the last time, they could not claim anything. And God is going to show favor. And so this favor now is, as it were, illustrated in a special way in Mary herself. We can apply this to us today, beloved. We are the objects of God's favor. God has placed us into a position of favor. Ephesians 1 describes that in a magnificent way. That we are now sons. We'll come back to that later also because Luke's gospel is one of the, is the gospel that describes the idea of sonship. God wanted to have sons for himself. And so we are now the object of favor, and we have been taken to favor in the beloved. That's how God looks at us. So I want to apply this again to us now. Mary was favored one, so are we. The, then the angel says, the Lord is with you. Now very practical. Could the Lord say that to us as we are here today? Could this be said of truth? 
the Lord is with you. With Mary, there was no hindrance. Mary was in tune with God. God could be with her. I think of Gideon. In days of great distress, the angel could say, could say to Gideon, the Lord is with you. There was one who was exercised. And from this, we may gather that Mary was an exercised believer. And I say this to the young people also. A young girl, 16, 17 years old, she was exercised and she walked in the presence of the Lord. The Lord was with her. And you find it also for the remnant in future days that the Lord will be with him in a very special way. Uh, Jeremiah, when he was called as a young man, we see that the Lord was with him. Very special way. Paul, in his ministry, he experienced the presence of the Lord. And this may be an encouragement for us to be so close to the Lord that we may experience his presence. That the Lord may be with us in a very special way. Then it says, Blessed art thou among women. Well, of course, that we understand. She was the only woman in the history, in human history, that was selected for this tremendous task. We find sometimes uh, w women that were blessed. I think of Jael, called by Deborah in uh, Judges 5. She co was called blessed. I think of the uh, faithful woman, the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. She's called blessed. And there are many passages also that the disciples are called blessed. But it is a very great privilege to be called blessed. I apply it again to us. Could the Lord say to us, blessed are you? Like in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, would we fit into that category of those whom the Lord can bless? Or the Lord says later on uh, to those around him in the house, blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. So that, that would be a wonderful theme to study in the scriptures those who are blessed. And that is then also a challenge for us to be exercised, to be found in the category of those people who are called blessed in the scriptures. And then we come to verse 29. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and casting her mind, what manner of salutation this was. You could say, you could translate it freely, she was dialoguing, she dialogued in herself, like asking questions and answering the question in her own mind. That is what the word means. And then we see in verse 30, the angel said unto her, fear not. Mary. That's one of these beautiful expressions we find time and again in this gospel to encourage the exercised believer. The angels in chapter 2 say it to the shepherds when the shepherds were greatly disturbed. Fear not. We find it many times. Fear not. And so this is a word of encouragement for you today. Perhaps you have to go to, through an operation next week or have to face all kinds of troubles. The Lord says, fear not. Fear not. This is an encouragement. We apply it now also to ourselves, of course. And then verse 30 says, For thou hast found favor with God. We commented on that already, the favor. But here the word is slightly different. Um, that thou didst find favor with God. So it is a wonderful thought to be the object of God's favor. And then also it is in the relationship with God. So that means that Mary was born again. There was a relationship with God. And then we come to verse 31. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. That's why I said earlier, uh, the announcement in uh, verse 27, a virgin, uh, we'll come back to that. Because the it would be unthinkable that God would use a woman who would not be a virgin. But there is a special reason for this. It was to make sure that we would understand that the Lord and his birth was not from the first Adam. Although there is a link with the first Adam, you'll see that in the genealogy in, Gen in uh, Luke 3, where Adam is seen as an illustration of a, uh, the man called born of God or son of God. In that sense, there is a link with the Lord and Adam because the Lord Jesus is a true son of God, as Adam was an illustration of this. But there is also a contrast. Adam became a sinner, and he was the head of a race of sinners. Genesis 5 describes that. His son was after his likeness, and he died, and he died, and he died. So Adam became the head of a race of sinners, and Romans 5 describes that. That is why it is so important to understand that, the Lord, that uh, Mary was a virgin, and then that she would conceive not from a man like Joseph, her husband-to-be, 
because then still the, the line of the first Adam would be continued. But God was going to break that line. He was going to introduce something entirely new, a new order of things. David, as you find in Matthew 1, the royal line was under condemnation and could not produce the Messiah. And so that was the second reason that God would take one from the other line of David. It had to be a descendant of David. And we will see that then uh, in more detail in, in uh, Luke uh, 3, at the, at the end of the genealogy, how this is described. But for now, you understand that what God is going to introduce is something entirely new, a new order of things. And that is connected with the thought of a virgin that has not had any, she has not had any relationship with a man who is descendant from the first Adam, but she will now, as we will see in a moment, be under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the verse says, here in verse 31, and bring forth a son. Now, I would like to see, you to understand this. This is one of the highlights in this gospel. The gospel presents man in sonship. God, why do I say this? Because the Lord Jesus, as you will see in Luke 3, is for the delight of God. This is my beloved son. You are my beloved son, in whom I found my delight. For God's pleasure. Sonship is for God's pleasure. And then we see the second line, and this is the line of application to us. That is what God has in mind for the believer today, that we will be sons for his pleasure, for his delight. Although there is a tremendous difference between the Lord Jesus, because he is the unique son of God, but we are not talking about him in his humanity. And even there is a tremendous difference, because the Lord Jesus was without sin, in him, in him was no sin, he knew no sin, and he did no sin. So there is a tremendous difference. Yet, there is a parallel, and that is that the idea of sonship, as we see in the Lord Jesus, in manhood, is an illustration of what God has in mind for us as believers, to be sons. That is why Hebrews 2 could say that he would lead many sons to glory. He is the firstborn among many brethren, and he is the great leader to lead the sons to the glory. So that is how Luke's gospel fits in his false ministry. And then thou shalt call his name Jesus. Here we have a mystery that Jehovah, because Jehovah says, that is the meaning of the name, at the same time would be a man. Who can understand that? That is a mystery of mysteries. We find that already indicated in the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord speaks and then the Lord speaks because it is the same person. In some passages we find that it is used interchangeably. The angel of the Lord and the Lord. And then we see that the angel of the Lord really is the person of the Godhead, if I may express it this way, who we know now as uh, the Lord Jesus, the Son. But these are mysteries. And faith accepts these mysteries, and faith bows down and worships. That's what we can do. We cannot argue about this, we cannot reason it out, we cannot demonstrate everything. We know from Scripture, Trinity, we know that, and that is now the mystery I want to underline, that God and man in one person who can fathom this. That is the mystery that's indicated here. His name, Jesus, means really implies God and man in one person. You'll see uh, next verses a little bit more about that. Verse 32, he shall be great. Now that is another point. The greatness of the Lord Jesus is emphasized so much. The word used here is the word mega, as we all know. This word is used in Hebrews many times uh, in connection with the Lord, in his greatness. And the angel says, he shall be great. Keep in mind, he will be greater than Moses. He will be greater than Abram. He will be greater than Aaron, the high priest. The Lord, he will be great. Greater than David, greater than Solomon, greater than the temple. Whatever you can say from the Old Testament, the Lord is always greater. Although he fulfills many of those concepts you find in the Old Testament, but the Lord is always greater. And that is why the forerunner, we have seen that John the Baptist, why the forerunner was going to be great. Because he is the forerunner, John the Baptist, the forerunner of one who is great. And so the forerunner also needed to be great. We find the word great uh, several times. I, I mentioned one point, when the Lord had raised the son of the widow in Nain, then the people said God, that God had raised a great prophet. We find the same word, a great prophet. And it says then here in verse 32, he shall be called son of the highest. Now, again, in connection with sonship, here is a concept that we find all through the gospel. We will find that the believers are seen as sons of peace, or sons of the highest, sons of the highest, or sons of Abram, 
or sense of resurrection. That idea of sonship is found many times. But here we find it, first of all, of course, in connection with the Lord Jesus. And I underline again, it's not only here the only begotten, the unique Son of the Father. The point is here that although he is the eternal Son, he is also in manhood Son of God and Son of the Highest. Because Son of the Highest means this will also be displayed in the millennium. In the millennium this will be seen because the highest or the most high God is the name of God in the millennium. And then this will be seen that the Lord Jesus, the humble man of Nazareth, he will be seen as the Son of the Most High. That is to be seen in the millennium, in this place. But this was already going to be a fact when the Lord would be born. He would be the Son of the Most High. Although nobody would believe, or almost nobody would believe it. And then it says, And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Here we find the link with the, prop the prophecies of the Old Testament. How many prophecies in connection with David were going to be fulfilled. Can we read 2 Samuel 7? Yesterday at the conference we referred to Psalm 132 and there are many more passages that we could think of. These promises were all going to be fulfilled. But in David we find a wonderful illustration of how the Lord will act as the true David. And also for us that is a, a comfort. The epistle uh, to Philadelphia it says that the Lord has the keys of David. He is the one who opens and closes. He is the beloved. The name David means beloved. And I, we can apply this now to us, that the Lord Jesus is the true David also for us. So before the millennium will start and his reign will be seen in glory and in display, he is already the true David for us, the beloved. And he opens up the treasures of God's house for us. Verse 33, he shall reign over the house of Jacob. It's another wonderful detail. David, uh, excuse me, David speaks about the sovereign grace of God and the man after God's heart. But when you think of Jacob, you don't see anything of man after God's heart. It's just the opposite. But in Jacob you see God's transformation, how God turned him around and who, how God transformed him. And then we can understand that the Lord Jesus has to do something in the house of Jacob. Imply this whole idea of God's sovereignty, how God called instead of Esau. Jacob, how God transformed him, how he's the choice of God, really, in his sovereignty, but then God transformed him, and God's going to fulfill all the promises for the house of Jacob, as you find in Jer Jeremiah 30, 33, Ezekiel, many passages. And then it says, of his kingdom there shall be no end. The thought of kingdom, we'll see later in this gospel also, is a prominent thought. I think about 45 times we have the word kingdom. So keep this in mind, we will need to come back to that many times because the Lord is now the king in rejection and we are identified with him in rejection. But this verse speaks about his kingdom in glory and his kingdom of his kingdom there shall be no end. And we will also share with him in that place. We will be the queen at his side. What a wonderful thought and privilege. Yeah, there are many passages that we can think of, but one of the verses I would refer to is Psalm 45, that we see the king as the beloved. The one who is going to reign, he is the beloved. And so that is another, that his name is David, the beloved. And uh, the other thought we find is his kingdom, there shall be no end. In contrast to the kingdom you find in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, they were only for a time. Till the great stone came, and then his kingdom will be forever. And in Isaiah, this is also confirmed. Of course, you Prophets have only in view the millennium, the world to come. They don't speak about the eternal state. And so in the eternal state, there is not the emphasis so much about rule, on rule. In the eternal state, the emphasis is more on condition. So that righteousness will dwell. The, the millennium righteousness will reign. And this reign there has no end, but it, it will be then uh, ushered into this new condition, the eternal state, where righteousness will dwell. And so there is not uh, the end of righteousness, that would be a wrong thought, but there is uh, going to be an end of rule, and there will be then the continuation of righteousness, but then in eternal condition according to God. Verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Now notice, the last time we have seen Zechariah's unbelief. His question or his answer to the angel was unbelief. Whereas in Mary we find now a question of belief. And you, you remember that it said these ten, ten paintings from chapter 1 and 2 often have contrast. 
And this is one of the contrasts we find. And so her question is now answered by the angel. It's like an opportunity to give a few more details. And so we will also have a bit more light about the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation. And in verse 35, the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. I want to draw your attention to three points here in verse 35. First of all, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. Secondly, the power of the Most High or the Highest shall overshadow thee. And the third point is, therefore, also thee. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing that shall be born. That is the third thing that I wanted uh, to draw attention. So first of all, this thought of the conception, that the Holy Spirit would come upon her. That's a mystery. But that's why I said earlier she had to be a virgin. It would be unthinkable that God would use a woman who is not a virgin. It's like the virgin tomb where the Lord was laid after he died. It needed to be a virgin character that God would choose. And that is why the believers also, as I said earlier, need to be seen in virgin character instead of being mixed with the world, virgin character. That is why the future remnant in Revelation 14 is seen in virgin character. God is using those who are virgin. Then the second word that we find here is the thought of overshadowing. I submit to you that this implies that the Holy Spirit was over Mary during the whole time of her pregnancy. And then later on we see how the Holy Spirit was with the Lord Jesus all the time. So the Holy Spirit is the great initiator here. God works through the Holy Spirit here. And that is now a point that I want to transfer to us. The moment that we came to know the Lord in repentance, that was because the Holy Spirit acted on us. But since that time, the Holy Spirit has stayed with us, overshadowed us. Of course, I'm drawing out parallel. There is also a tremendous contrast. This was uh, physically too with Mary. That was a unique occasion. But I think the scriptures present these things also as object lessons for the believer today. That the Holy Spirit is also overshadowing us now to preserve us in this evil world and to produce fruit for God that you can compare them with the holy thing that was born, the fruit of the Spirit. That is what is produced for God. But now to come back to that second expression, how the Holy Spirit overshadows her, I link that with the idea of the Shekinah glory. You find how the Shekinah glory came in the tabernacle and overshadowed everything. We will see the same expression in uh, Luke 9, when the Lord was there in the Mount of Transfiguration and this cloud came over him and also over the disciples. And this cloud overshadowed them. That's the same word that is used. And what really struck me to see that the same word is used by Paul. When he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because then he refers to the privilege that in his weakness, the Lord's strength would overshadow him, would, would rest upon him. And there the same word is used. So, this is also a great comfort for us. As the Holy Spirit was with Mary to overshadow her, in such a way, God the Holy Spirit wants to overshadow us. I'm not denying that he indwells us. That's another truth. That's also true. But at the same time, in his dealings with us, he overshadows us. He protects us. But that implies total dependence. Like Paul was dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit and on the Lord. This implies complete dependence as we see here with Mary also, this complete dependence and submission, as you will see in, in a later verse. And so the holy thing that would be born would be called Son of God. I underline here the thought of holy. So the fruit of the Spirit here that is seen now in the birth of the Lord Jesus, here of course, he is Son in manhood. He's called the Son of God. Here it is in manhood. At the same time, he is the eter eternal Son of God. Believer, be beloved, we cannot fathom this. This is a mystery. But Son of God in manhood, there he is the head of a new race. There he can share with us. He is the leader of a new race. Eternal Son, he can only keep for himself. He cannot share this with us. That is unique. But as Son of God in manhood, he can be the head of a whole generation of sons, as we see in this gospel. Now, the thought of holiness contrasts with Adam. Adam was innocent before the fall. The Lord Jesus is the Holy One from day one forever. And so we may follow his footsteps. In this world may be characterized by this holiness. That is one of the challenges that is implied in the application uh, to us. 
And then we come to verse 36. And behold, Elizabeth, thy cousin, or thy relative, your relative, she has also conceived the son in her old age. So now the angel uses this uh, to encourage Mary. She, uh, the angel refers now to something that has happened, and we've seen that the last time or the time before, how this was a great miracle. First of all, she was, uh, Elizabeth was barren. She had passed the age to have a child, and yet God had come in. And probably Zechariah was too old also, like Abram when Abram and Sarah received their son Isaac. It was really three miracles in a row, but at the same time. And so this miracle would be an encouragement then for Mary also. And the angel says, this is the six months with her who, has called, who was called barren. We have noticed already the point of the six months. And now what we will find is when Mary goes out and visits Elizabeth, Elizabeth knows through the Holy Spirit that Mary is to be the mother of the Messiah. We will see that the next time Lord will But now I want to underline this wonderful verse. For with God nothing shall be impossible. That was another encouragement uh, on behalf of the angel. To encourage Mary. Like the human mind would be baffled. You would say, well, this is impossible. That cannot be. With God nothing shall be impossible. And so it is also in the application for us. If we would have a friend who is unbelievable, we would say, it's impossible that he will be saved. Or we have a relative, impossible that this person will be saved. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And we see how this thought is quoted many times in situations of total, in situations that there would not be any way out. Then this is often quoted, this thought, that with God, nothing can, shall be impossible. Then the last verse, and I want to comment on that a little bit more, Mary's response. We noticed already earlier, this is not a response of unbelief, like with Zechariah. This is a response of belief. It is a response in submission. We see how Mary simply says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. This is so precious, beloved. She believes, she submits to the word of God, spoken through the angel, and she says, Be it unto me according to thy word. So she submits to the word of God because she recognized the angel is God's representative. Now I want to apply this to us today. What we see here with Mary, she takes the place of a handsmaid. Literally, in the original, it is the place of a bond woman, a bond slave. A bond slave means no will of your own, totally subject to the, to the owner. So she owns God also in his uh, rights on her. Do we own God in his rights on us? God as creator, God as redeemer, do we own his right? And do we take a place of a bond servant? A bond servant who is totally dependent on his master. A bond servant who is loyal. You will find this loyalty with Mary. She wants to be subject. She wants to be loyal to God as her master and totally dependent upon him. It's very remarkable that the early Christians uh, who received the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 are also called bond slaves. The uh, believers, the sisters are called uh, bond uh, handmaids or bond uh, women. So that shows in Acts 2 that this is also something that God has in mind for the believers in general. Here it is for Mary. But what you find in Luke's Gospel in connection with the Lord Jesus as an example for us is worked out in the book of Acts in general as the believers. You will see that many times. Luke's Gospel, the Lord in prayer. The book of Acts, the believers in prayer. Luke's Gospel, the Lord in sonship. The book of Acts, the believers in sonship. And so there are many parallels between Luke and Acts, where you find the emphasis in Luke on the Lord and his, and the model he is for us, and then worked out in the lives of the believers in the book of Acts. And then we read, the angel departed from her. So God closes the, uh, he puts here the veil over the whole situation. This holy matter of the conception of the Lord is explained here, as far as we need to know it, but how this really occurred, we don't know anything about it, and that's completely hidden for us. But we know the fact, and that's sufficient. Just let me review if I forgot the important thing, and if not, you will remind me uh, of this. There are so many beautiful gems, of course, in this uh, passage that we have read together, but uh, I want to give some time to you for uh, your questions. But uh, perhaps you can underline once more this line. We see, on the one hand, the presentation of Christ, the anointed one, we'll see that many times, uh, who represents the new order of things, and God introduces a new order of things with Christ. But then we see how 
that is at the same time a illustration for the believer today. We have seen that already several times and we'll see that many times more. But at the same time, the scriptures guard over the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus as the eternal Son. He is absolutely unique. And so when he is seen as the head of a new race, he is seen there in manhood as the head of a new race. That is the point that I really want you to understand. And if you have questions about this uh, or other things, uh, please uh, feel free to. In our King James, it says the son of Lot of the heart, the son of the heart, and I believe in the new translation, it says the son of the heart. And if we get out of that unique, um, you have bring up the thought there, uh, but I want to tie that in with the fact of the article being themselves. And that was beautiful because when I saw that, that it is not only as we have in the painting, son of the house as a whole, the son of Mary and the son of Moses, mm-hmm. but in essence, to the, his very character and nature, that he is God. Uh, and and um, I believe that's why we are able to do that stuff uh, in the new translation. This bringing up the essence of his very nature, uh, as a new creation, you would be bringing on that line of him as son, as man, but yet son of God in his very nature. So Mary would have seen that this one is a unique one, it's very God manifest in fact. This is uh, perhaps difficult to understand, that's why I would not take too much time for it now, but at the same time, I believe that believers in Luke's Gospel are also called sons of Hyatt, of the highest. But I have to check that to see whether the article is used there or not. But it's a beautiful point that again, again underlines how precise the Word of God is. Is it not remarkable that the, the Spirit of God would use uh, the Luke to bring out some of these details here, which you don't find in the other Gospels? So yeah, just interrupt you for one sec. That is, first of all, yeah, you, you emphasize because he's a doctor, so he brings out these uh, these details. But I think also because of the burden he had to make things clear to uh, readers from a Gentile background who were not familiar with all the Jewish customs. So he goes into many details to explain the Jewish customs. The Jewish readers would not need to know, because they know them already. But the Gentile uh, readers would need to know these customs and the meaning of these customs. That is uh, another point that you need to underline at the same time then. Also, most of the uh, promises given here, uh, we shall be great, uh, the Lord will be in the kingdom of God, and so on. They speak more than such on Jewish lines. Yes, although uh, we cannot... Um, but I would like to underline at the same time that the uh, Gentiles are implied, because even in the millennial reign, the Lord will rule also over the Gentile world. And uh, I forgot to mention that earlier, I think there was a reference to, but we found it many times in Luke's Gospel that the door for the Gentiles is opened in many, many ways. Although at the same time, God's promises to the Jews are emphasized and are going to be fulfilled. But it is a wider scope than in Matthew. Right. Stated you're writing somewhere that in Luke, the order of the event is a moral order. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by a moral order, A and B? Where does the moral order begin? Where does the moral order end? How do we understand the moral order as you think of the, the, the order in Luke? Well, uh, I commented on that a little bit uh, by saying that first of all, we need to have the historic order. And Luke examines the historic order uh, and the historic facts, but then he presents them in such a way 
that a moral lesson is brought out at the same time. That is what I would uh, like to underline. He brings out facts, but he puts them together in such a way that there is a moral lesson obvious at the same time. And so that is why I said, look, in Luke it is a moral order.